as it relates to interacting with recruiters, that's normally kind of like your first taste of HR. And of course, they're going to be friendly. They're essentially a salesperson. They're trying to sell you on the company. Um, they're going to try to find information. And the way that you would interact with the recruiter is just understand their role. Their role is a little bit as a gatekeeper to the hiring manager. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Diego Granados, and I'm a product manager, and I have a very special guest with us today. Today, I'm interviewing Daniel Space. He's a senior HRPP consultant and speaker. He's expert in fan tech, media, and entertainment. He's also a passionate video gamer, HR nerd, and you can find him as a TikTok star, VHR Vault. Hey, Daniel, how's everything going? How are you? Hey, how are you? Very nice, very nice to uh, talk to you. I'm going well. It's going well. How are you? I'm doing good, thank you. And thanks again for being with us today. And for those of uh, uh, those of you out there that haven't had a chance to meet Daniel, Daniel, why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Sure, so I'm kind of a, I'm an HR geek. I've been in HR for almost 20 years. I started in financial services and I was at the right place at the right time with WebMD when the financial crash happened, which simultaneously the HR business partner model really started to come into play. And so I had a lot of experience doing HR business partner work for digital advertisers that then got my um, experience up within internet companies, as well as then I went and worked for EA Games for a while, and uh, most recently with Spotify. And I uh, retired from corporate America beginning of 2020 and have since just been consulting. And you mentioned that you are an HRBP or human resources business partner. What right. exactly do HRBPs do and why is it so important for us to know about this role? You know, it's funny because I didn't realize how bad of a job we were doing at marketing what we were doing until I left corporate America. And I was like, oh my God, people think we do that? Like, that's not what we're doing. Good God. So HR business partners are essentially their business consultants, but with the perspective of HR. So in a sense, in most tech companies, especially the goal of the HR business partner is in many ways to act like the, the mini CHRO for that business unit. So we're consultants to the business as far as just creation, maintenance and delivery of a talent strategy. So one of the most important elements to it is the idea of, of, of staffing. So what we do is that we work with executives to put business strategies into headcount and then develop a, a hiring plan based on that. So everything from the leveling of the roles coming up with a compensation strategy, working with recruiters for a recruiting strategy, and then just really strong org design to make sure that the business model reflects what the business goals are doing. That is fantastic. Thanks for breaking that up uh, for us a little bit. And let's take a step back for a moment. Let's talk about HR. There's a lot of you know mysticism and a lot of myths around it, but can you tell us what do they do? We normally think about HR as one key player of the recruitment process, but then after that, we're not sure what they're in charge of or what they're supposed to do. Yeah, it's and it's again, HR is uh, the more the more I've seen, I'm like, oh my god, like oh, HR needs to kind of like reverse and have maybe like a marketing business partner sit on the HR leadership team to teach them how to talk to its audience. Like this is just, I think, where the the next generation of HR should go. So the the easiest way to think about HR is that we're we're business function the way every other business function is. So if you think about the the, the huge uh, large business functions of finance, IT, sales, marketing, each one of those is in charge of something, and HR is the same. We're just in charge of all of the people related strategies and processes. That's it. Um, and every company can have a different HR function. Every company can have a different HR structure. Every HR professional is different. But our one similarity is that we all work in the function that manages people strategies. And so when typically you're interviewing for product management, in, in the case of some of the viewers here or any role, having a phone call with HR is typically the first, ter the first step in the interview process. How should this interaction be? HR always seems very friendly, you know? Is HR really your friend or are they only looking for the benefit of the company? Oh, that's, that's such a good question. It's like anyone who watches my TikToks knows like that's a triggering question for me. <laughs> so I think like all professionals, of course, HR people can be friendly. Um, like that's that's our job. Uh, recruiting, recruiting be like the front line of HR. And this is 10 department that a lot of people know of, but like there's like six other disciplines within HR that a lot of people don't realize. 
So as it relates to interacting with recruiters, that's normally kind of like your first taste of HR. And of course, they're going to be friendly. They're essentially a salesperson. They're trying to sell you on the company. Um, they're going to try to find information. And the way that you would interact with the recruiter is just understand their role. Their role is a little bit as a gatekeeper to the hiring manager. And so they've worked with the hiring manager. Um, they've opened the role. Like, and all of this was by me long in advance. Like I've helped the hiring manager and recruiter understand how to write a good job description and what our recruiting strategy is going to be. Then the recruiter really kind of utilizes their knowledge of the business and the hiring manager to sort through a whole bunch of resumes and applications, as well as potentially does some sourcing to really try to navigate who those best key people are going to be that the hiring manager would find valuable to, to interview. And now let's say that I go through those gates. I do the HR interview, first round, final round, get my offer. And now, you know, I got my offer and I'm the new product management in the product manager in the company or the new employee in the company. How should I think about developing myself? So that it's such an important question. And it's something that we don't teach well in colleges and in universities, but your career and your development should be one of the, the primary things that you value. And so um, I'm not a good artistic person, but I normally uh, view a little bit like a, like a three-legged stool. And as it relates to development, one pillar is you and you and what you want to do. And then the other pillar is your manager as your guide, as someone who can give you feedback, someone who can develop you, someone who could make sure that you're kind of on some sort of path. And then what HR does is we provide the tools, resources, and best practices to do that. So in many cases, what we'll do is we'll design things like management coaching or management classes that help managers have these conversations. One of the other things that we do is create things like job family matrices so that a manager can speak to their employee and say, hey, congratulations, you're a product manager. This is really great. Do you want to continue down the product manager path? Because here's what this looks like. In the next two years, I want to get you to senior product manager. And this means you have to demonstrate this, this, and this. Or do you want to go into product marketing? Do you want to go into engineering? Do you want to go to machine learning? Do you want to go into HR? Like, and so all of these different career family matrices are some of the tools and resources that HR tries to provide so that managers can have really effective conversations with their employees, but it's always up to the employee to drive their own career. And I think it's something so important that we actually believe that once you know, we go through the interviews, we get the job, we just stop talking to HR. And so when it comes to you know, finding the right person, we, we now know a little bit more about HR BPs. Uh, how do I find one in the company and what kind of relationship should I have with them? So it's, it's sort of like, it's a, it's a little bit of a two edged sword because all of us who are in HR, who are HR BPs, especially, we keep a very, um, a very conscientious distance between employees. And it's not because we don't adore you and not because we don't want the absolute best for you, but it's to pr make sure that we're avoiding any perceived favoritism. So the goal, the, 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 the optimal goal for a good HRBP, all of us want the same thing, that we are making your experience as beneficial as possible as relates to career, to development, to compensation, to challenges, your professional growth, but we're doing that through managers. So anytime someone comes to me to ask for me, hey, I'm frustrated about my salary, hey, I'm frustrated about my growth, I'm like, okay, I can give you some general information, but the, your, it, should, it should be your manager who's doing this. And so what we try to do on as HRBPs is really try to create as much value as possible by focusing on leaders versus on employees. So I always think it's good to have a good relationship with your HR person. I can say that HRBPs are notoriously very lonely. Um, and we actually really like hearing about what you're working on. So one of the best things I'll, I do encourage people to do is don't reach out to me for career or salary conversations, but do reach out to me every once in a while. Just tell me how it's going and then show me something that you're doing. And I, I think that would be much more beneficial. That is great. Thanks for sharing that tip. I certainly will have to uh, search for my HRBPs and start reaching out to them to have this type of conversations. And uh, it, I mentioned, you know, as an example, a few minutes ago that, hey, I'm a new uh, employee. What should I do? How do I think about development? But now let's say, you know, some time has passed and now I'm a PM in the team that has some experience. How do I how should I think about a promotion? How do how do I get promoted? So a uh, really great question. And one of the things that I really am a big believer in is the idea of a growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And promotions tend to be one of the most controversial and very strangely driven things. And one of the things that will, um, I always find really good conversations when an employee says to me, I've been here for two years and I haven't been promoted. I'm like, okay, wh one, why are you talking to me? Have you spoken to your manager? Because if your manager says you should come talk to me, then I gotta talk to your manager because they're, they've dropped their ball. Um, but then two, why do you think tenure has anything to do with promotion? 
Promotion means that you are increasing in scope, in impact, and in responsibility. And it means that both you as the employee have demonstrated employee, um, employee readiness, but we also look at something called organizational need. We could have nine people that are all really qualified to be a director of product management, we need one. So those are both the elements that go into what we call a promotion. The problem with promotion is that it's like an event that ends. And then, you know, human beings are never happy. So three months after us being excited and putting on our new title on our business card, then we're like, all right, now what? Um, and so I always prefer the term progression and development because that just continues like, you're just being, seeing these things as little stops along the way. But if you're thinking about progression and development, what that seems to, uh, what, at least for me, is that it seems that it's more of a journey and it's like, Here's a little checkpoint that I got. I'm not aiming for promotion because that's a dead end stop. I'm aiming for a progression in which I got recognition for something and then I'm keeping going. And then along with that progression and, and getting promoted, another big question that we have is compensation. It, it always yeah. seems awkward to talk about it. Uh, how do I talk about compensation? Should I be talking about it with my coworkers about you know how much money I make? How do I go about compensation? So there's been there's been so many changes over the last few years, and it's over the last 10 years especially. Um, so one of the critical things that HRBPs really try to do is we stamp out pay practices and incentive modeling that that encourage bad behavior. So one of the things that we made sure of was the removal of any kind of bonus where if a hiring manager um, sort of uh, hires less than their headcount budget, they would get a bonus, like because that really exhibited the wrong behavior. One of the big problems that we have in compensation, and I think only HRBPs and people that work in compensation are just in a place of privilege to completely understand both perspectives, is that one of the reasons that there's so much controversy and so much anxiety about this topic is just because companies are just very obscure with it. And so what I started to do was I went a little bit rogue with the last two companies I worked with and was like, you know what, I'm just gonna talk, I'm just gonna have compensation coaching conversations with the teams themselves and say, this is how it works. And there was just almost this feeling of disappointment. Like they wanted so much more mystery and intrigue. They thought we had like a Donald Duck Tower in the back of Scrooge McDuck diving through gold that we were hiding back. And it's like, no, there's a scientific model and there, here's what market value is and here's what ranges are, here's what midpoints are. And just by having that conversation, I just saw that there was so much less churn, so much less mystery, so much less complication around it. And just treating people like adults is really just the best part of having compensation conversations. And I think the biggest opportunity is making sure that HR is really focused on ensuring that managers can have really comfortable conversations with their employees. And so that both sides should be able to bring it up without that feeling of anxiety of just saying, I just want to have a conversation about com compensation. How does this company pay me? How, how am I being paid against my peers? Can someone help validate that? Who, who do we compare against market with? And I found that when you have this conversation, when you tell employees this, then they're like, oh, okay, well, yeah, that works. I always tell employees while you can speak to each other, it's not generally effective because one, employees lie to each other all the time. You guys lie to each other about your pay <laughs> far more than we do. And you know, it's it's not just lying. It's also because like, um, you know, when you get your first salary, it's a really nice round even number, but then you get two merit increases and it becomes like this complex group of numbers. And the amount of times where employees have come to me saying, we put together this spreadsheet everyone is underpaid and I'll, I have all the data. I'm like, okay, so it's 48% wrong. Like you guys are just come flat out lying to each other. <laughs> but that to me though, at least sends a signal that, okay, there, there's a gap of understanding. So my general guidance is you should be talking to your manager about compensation more than anyone else, because they're the ones that have the direct ability to influence it. You can talk to your coworkers, like to build a gauge, to build a barometer, but you really just have to make sure that you're taking any data that you get with a grain of salt. Unless you're on someone else's payroll, like you don't know how much they make. Okay, so we've learned today a little bit of the individual responsibilities or, or the key aspects of HR and how I should talk to my manager for compensation. But uh, when we think about promotions, when we think about compensation, when we think about development, we typically just think of our boss. Like that's the first person that most of the time I would go to directly to, to sort these things out. And, and we typically don't think of HR as a player into that. So if you could help us understand just when it comes to promotions, development, growth, what are the roles and, and how does the interaction work between myself, HR, and um, you know my manager for all of these topics? Yeah, it's a great question. So in most cases, what will happen is, especially um, good HR people will typically meet with their leads to anywhere between one to three times a year and just sit down with all the leads and say, 
we're taking off a day or two and we're just going to talk about all your employees and what's weird is some employees kind of found out about this and, and got upset and i was like well, don't be upset like we're doing this because of how valuable and how important you are but again it just goes into because we're not announcing it like someone was like oh my god i just found out our leads just met off site with our hr person and just talked about all of us i'm like yeah it's because you're that important like <laughs> of course we want to do that so one of the things that we do is essentially what we call talent calibrations and that's so what you're starting to see right now is a lot of companies move away from like a forced annual rating where everyone like had to get rated between one to five and a lot of tech companies especially started to really acknowledge that this was not a very proactive or useful way to do performance management no one liked it the employees didn't like it managers didn't like it hr didn't like it and instead we're moving on to like a coaching conversation model where we're just focusing instead on how to have really good conversations but we're utilizing two to three times a year to do checkpoints so one of the best parts about this is that instead of meeting with every manager and getting like their ranks for their team, I'm just meeting with the managers all together and we're going through every employee. But one of the most important parts about that is that it gives all the managers a chance to calibrate. So I'll meet, let's say if I was doing product management, I would meet with each VP of product management and the senior directors to say, okay, so just to make sure we're all talking the same language, what does someone who's like a really high performer look like? Just to make sure that everyone is kind of thinking through the same perspective. At that point, then it, it, it's based on company, but in most cases, what will happen is HR will help create the platform, the strategy and the consultative approach onto how to review promotions. Like, so in the most optimal way, I'm almost really hands off. I'm helping facilitate, I'm helping guide, but I'm, all I'm doing is encouraging the managers to talk between themselves because if the managers then talk between themselves and then agree and say, hey, out of these 18 promotions, we wanna move forward with 12. And then I can say, okay, well, we can afford 10, do we want to maybe give 12 with a little bit weak? Do we want to give eight really meaningful ones? And then the ones that are promoted that didn't get promoted, we'll just get a, something else to make up for it. And then it really just is this group of leaders who are helping decide on, on your growth. And especially one of the best things that that builds is leadership accountability across the team. So that one of the best positives that I see is that all of the leaders will, will view their highest performers as ours and not mine. That is fantastic. Thank you for giving us that insight that I think many of us are not exposed to, and it just helps understand a little bit more how the organization works, right? And and making sure that, you know, promotions development is not just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our manager, but really there's a lot that happens behind the scenes to, to make things happen. So thanks for clarifying that for us. Yeah, of course. Another question that I have for you is what are the common stereotypes around HR that you want people to be more aware of? Oh, I'm so glad you asked this. And it's because again, HR um, does not do a good job of marketing itself, but there's that stereotype that we mentioned before a little bit, like, and it's something again, that is very triggering and my TikTok followers know it and they'll make fun <laughs> of me when someone says it. When someone says, when the huge complexity of a situation is presented and someone says as a result, well, HR is not your friend, they're only on the side of the employee. That demonstrates such a, a, an ignorance as to what HR's value is. Because just like everything else, you can't put HR in a binary and nor are we a shared hive collective. Like we are just a business function and we're made up of, of people and human beings that are all allowed to be different and have to make mistakes and grow. And anyone who thinks that HR just thinks in terms of protecting the company, I always try to educate that that's legal's job. Legal's job is protect, protect the company. And there's many cases where HR and legal could be in, in dispute. HR's mindset is what makes the most sense for the most people. And in many cases where people say it's only on the side of the company, not on the side of the employee, it's missing the fact that the employee is the company. They're both are, um, and only, you can only kind of get experience with this when you work in HR for so long, you start to realize there's no difference. There's no triangulation. Like for us, an employee is part of the company. And there's plenty of times where we make decisions and we make recommendations that benefit the employee over the company and other times where it's perceived as not. And so it's just by really um, understanding that HR is far more complex and it can't be categorized into two polar opposites like that. And it's made up of so many other professionals, especially like there's benefit professionals, compensation professionals, L&D professionals whose sole job is to do things for the company and to make the or to do things for the employees on behalf of the company. And so when you just uh, dichotomize into that section like that, it just does a, it does a lot of devaluing into the work that we're trying to do. That was so interesting. Like I'm learning so much through this interview. Um, <laughs> another question that I got for you is every 
couple days, every couple hours, you see on LinkedIn th things like via recruiter and tons of, you know, ways that recruiters should improve their way to do things. Are recruiters on LinkedIn? Are they reading these things? Are these posts useful? Um, what's going on with these type of posts? Oh, my, I'm so glad you asked. So we went into one of my other, um, one of my other areas where I've developed a reputation that may not be quite as savory, where I attack what I call LinkedIn influencers. So to me, what I saw, and I, I was, again, I was really fortunate to, to be in a place where I was an independent contractor when COVID happened. So I was able to watch what happened a lot closer than I think HRBPs were very focused on the work we're doing. So I went to LinkedIn because this was now going to be the place where all these unemployed people were looking and I wanted to help. And I was gonna post like resume information, interview advice. And because this is my job, I designed this. I, I designed workforce planning for, for companies. So I'm in a really privileged spot that I know a lot, but I couldn't get any of my posts up because there were LinkedIn influencers who wrote like dear recruiter emails and they would have 22,000 hits and, and shares and comments. And it's like, you have to watch you. And it's one thing that is a huge thing in all of my videos and all my content, always check the receipts of anyone that you're, you're going to take advice from. And when you look at these LinkedIn influencer posts, the dear recruiters, dear hiring managers, dear HR, they have never worked in recruiting or HR. So they're in no position to talk about how job search works. Um, you know, really the only, there's three roles that have this and not because we're naturally good at it, but this is what we do. So recruiters, HR people, and executive um, leads will have the most experience as it relates to here's the common trends that will help you get employed. And when you look at these posts from the LinkedIn influencers, they're their LinkedIn audience engagement growth marketers. And so all they're doing is coming up with a script that emotionally manipulates the frustrations of job seekers. And they just do that to build engagement on their likes and on their pages. And now at this point, nine of them have blocked me because every time they make one of those posts, I call them out on it and I say, hey, do you think instead of writing this useless email that no one cares about, um, could you use your reach instead to talk about a free job search webinar? Could you have your each of your people post any open roles they have in their company? You know, here's two free resources I have on how to build a better resume. And most of them would just block me instead of that. So what I normally tell people is that the no one is reading those dear manager and dear recruiting posts like, oh, that's what I should do. Like, it's not done for recruiters and hiring managers. It's done to manipulate you so that you engage with the post. Now, the problem, though, is that with LinkedIn's recent activity, what I started seeing was someone would make that post, dear hiring managers, stop being so picky. You don't need experience. All you need is someone with the right level of the right level of, of character. And I, of course, am too little minded. And I would write, well, how do you have like, right level of character if you need six years of data science experience? Like, what does that mean exactly? But of course, all the posters are like, oh, my God, yes, please hire me. I have character. And I'm just thinking to myself like, okay, but no hiring manager recruiter is thinking, oh yeah, I should totally do this instead. Like this is not the audience for it. It's just to build engagement. But the problem is if you commented on that and said, yeah, there was one person I saw where they, they said, recruiters are the effing worst. I can't stand them right now. And I did a screenshot of their profile and said, okay, just so you know, if I was a recruiter or hiring manager, this is the very first thing I see on your profile that you commented this. So not only are you being emotionally manipulated to further someone else's business, but you're ruining your job chances along the way. So as a LinkedIn, as a, uh, as a complete product, you just have to be very careful of, because I think there's so much value to it, but it comes with risk. And those are one of the biggest riskiest things to avoid. I, I have one last question for you today. Do you have any last words of advice for all of those out there who are new at the company or who are new in the role and, and how they should think about career, progression, development, or anything else? Yeah, so um, I'm not going to get a lot of love for this, but I, <laughs> as a free agent, I can say what I want. Uh, companies do not do a good job of keeping up with the market. The market will always outpace how much a company can do. And I've seen companies try to be very, as progressive as possible. And this is one thing I know we didn't cover on the question, but um, I just want to also take this as an opportunity. When you're in a salary negotiation as a new employee, HR's goal is not to lowball you. In most cases, at least, good HR people with. And by the, I'm speaking as the person you are negotiating with. So <laughs> during, as, because I'm the guardian of our compensation strategy, any offer that the recruiter it's above the recruiter's ability to approve will come to me and to the hiring manager for review. And so when I, one of the most important elements of compensation is the company's not trying to lowball you, what the company wants to do ideally, and we found science to back this up, if I can make you an offer 
that's exciting to you, that's great. That's, that's our optimal space. I want you to be excited, but it has to be fair. And so when I say fair, it means I'm looking at internal equity. I'm looking at the, the, the pay band across the team. I'm making sure that we're, I'm paying attention as closely to gender, to ethnicity, to race, to disability, to veteran status, even to LGBT cuts. So anytime you're talking about salary negotiation with a company, never think the company's trying to lowball you. It could be that it's just not in the accurate market or it could be internal equity protection. Uh, so that was one. And then two, the advice just as, as it relates to, as a, new, as a new person in the job market, you do yourself a little bit of a disservice by staying with the company for more than four to five years. What we're starting to see is that someone who has remained with the company for too long, not only is one suffering from big market decay because no one can keep up with the market, but two is starting to miss out on potential value as it relates to um, flexibility and versatility in their profile. So what I've started to see now is that most of the time, a lot of value is placed on someone who's moving every three to four years, because not only are they keeping in touch with the market and those big market shifts, but also getting really versatile and well-rounded experience. Daniel, thank you so much for being with us today. This was so awesome. I, I think we all learn a lot. So thanks again for, for being with us today. Of course, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone. Uh, we'll see you next time.